We're so grateful to Robert for enlightening and delighting us once again. Robert inspired generations of Latimerians during his long career at the school, and we are thrilled that he continues to share his knowledge and insights with us. Many of you will know these talks raise money for the bursary in Robert's name. Your donations, when added to those for Robert's previous lectures in this series, have raised over a thousand pounds for the holder of the Robert Orme bursary. And in total, Robert's lectures have raised a fantastic 3,725 pounds for his bursary. Now, before I hand over to Robert, a bit of housekeeping. Please do write any questions you may have in the chat facility to the right of your screens so we can discuss as many of them as time allows after the talk. And we'd ask you to keep yourselves muted until we start the Q&A session so that we can all hear clearly. Now, without further ado, Robert, over to you. We started in the Middle Ages, uh, then last week we were into the Renaissance, and today it's after 1800, and it's going to be a mixture of looking at things that connect to Romanticism and also to uh, modernism. And there was in the late 19th century an actual movement in literature and art that called itself Symbolist Symbolism in literature and in art. And we're going to start by considering the kind of definition of symbolism that was produced by an art critic like this. This is um, Emile Verheeren, painted by Theo van Rieselberg. And uh, he was an art critic who wrote about. Uh, Fernand Knopf, who we're going to look at today, and he came up with his definition of what actually made a painting a symbolist uh, painting. He said that it was the union of perception and inner feeling. So what we're going to do is to look at that as a kind of theme where you'll see what are the new kinds of developments of symbolism that arguably came in the 19th century. But a lot of um, 19th century and art movements were actually really inherently anti-symbolist. If you start with um, the kind of landscape that was produced in the early Romantic period by John Constable, this is Dead and Vale, 1828, I would argue that this is the very antithesis of symbolism. Uh, he was interested in painting the natural world in a realistic kind of way. He got ready for these kind of paintings by going out with sketchbooks and watercolours, drawing clouds, drawing trees and so on, and then put them together into this kind of picture, which was, he hoped, a naturalistic image of the Norfolk um, countryside. And though nowadays we as art historians would find symbolism in it, we'd say that he was looking for a lost Arcadia of rural England that didn't really exist, either in the agrarian economy or of the time of the Industrial Revolution, uh, when he was producing this sort of painting, he was hoping for an immediate spontaneous reaction by people to this natural image that he was producing of the um, world. So therefore, romantic landscape is about naturalism and perception, not just about um, symbolism. You also get a new kind of art movement that appears in the uh, late 19th century, where you get the development of photography. And when you look at, um, uh, so where it's, you get the new kind of art that was going to look at uh, narrative painting, like in this, which is W.P. Frith, painting of Derby Day, 1856. And these kind of um, narrative pictures were very popular in the Royal Academy and Victorian art world. And this always reminds me of a kind of Dickens novel where he's a very highly skillful painter doing lots of realistic faces, characterizing the people, getting in, showing what they're involved in on Derby Day. And it's very like the kind of uh, emotions and caricatures of people that appear in Dickens novels. And therefore this would be an example of um, realism. Uh, the new kind of art that was going to appear was going to be the way in which um, photography was going to come into existence in exactly this kind of period. This is about the first ever photograph from about 1835 by Fox Talbot at his home Laycock Abbey. And when you look at what photography was about in its earliest days, uh, this is not um, a painting, uh, an image for a Gothic horror story. 
Uh, this is not um, chivalric romance and Gothic art. Instead, this is part of um, Fox Talbot's scientific experiments where he was able to show that actually photography was simply going to be light that came through this window and he developed the chemicals to fix the light on the back paper in the camera so that you could actually get these kind of photos and it created a new easy form of realism which satisfied people in its own kind of uh, right. So therefore you get this as a big change in the way that art is actually marketed and sold and appreciated in the 19th century. And of course, this sort of development in photography is what was arguably the most significant of the development in art in the late 19th century, where you begin to get the development of impressionism. So when you look at Impression Sunrise, 1872, this painting was given the name by the critics that actually led to these paintings being called impressionist. And the idea was that this was going to be an impression of what actually the artist could see. And of course, 19th century style had proved and shown that eyesight simply was about the eye opening to light the Sorry, um, can I just interrupt, Robert? I can't hear you very well. Yeah, Does anyone exactly. else have the same problem? Uh, did you nudge something by mistake? Or cover your iPad? No, I don't think so. Oh, that's it, that's now. better. That's it, yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, sorry. I was pulling my hand over the microphone. Uh, but basically, you've got here the beginning of what was called and nicknamed Impressionism. And in 1892, uh, Monet worked laboriously on this enormous series of paintings of um, Rouen Cathedral. And when you look at um, Rouen Cathedral, you can see a whole series of paintings that he'd produced. And you could have expected that these enormous differences in terms of way they're painted and color and so on, were going to be something to do with expressionism. Is this actually him on a good day or a bad day? Him expressing his emotions? Well, of course, it isn't anything to do with that at all. They took from photography the notion that all you can actually see is reflections of light and therefore the job of the painter is to actually choose moments, particular instants of time when there is a particular kind of light effect and you have this same building and you don't get bored painting it because you're all the time actually painting simply the light effects that reflect off it. So there's no symbolism in this, it's not expressionist, it is actually deliberately attempting to create a new kind of imitation of reality to give the impression of the light effects. And as you know, most of the impressionist paintings are actually going to be paintings which are deliberately trying to paint everyday life. Their speciality was the life of the bourgeoisie in the city. And though again, we will find all sorts of symbolism inherent in the way that they portray the bourgeois families or Seurat shows the aristocracy or the working class, uh, those are not necessarily the actual aims of the uh, Impressionists themselves. They were trying to be painters of modern life, everyday life, and therefore not interested in uh, symbolism. And you also get a genre of highly impressionistic portraits that come into existence. And some of the best are actually produced by the American John Singer Sargent. This is Mrs. Chester Beatty in 1910. And these are exactly the kind of image for which he became most famous, where you have this very rich American millionaire's wife, and you are able to paint her in this highly impressionistic kind of way because he came from America and trained in Paris, and went to Italy. And then what he did was to be the master of actually using very free, easy, quick brushwork like an impressionist painter, where he could create the silks and the draperies and the lace and so on, and therefore create an image which was so naturalistic in the way that it was painted. And again, we would look at this as art historians in terms of its symbolism and the way in which it was actually going to um, get to show sort of the wealth of the American capitalist society. But it didn't have those kind of aims. It did aim to show social status and wealth, but at the same time, it is Sonsinger Sargent showing off his virtuoso skill as a um, painter. Therefore, you get new modern art movements like Impressionism 
that dominate and influence the way that art develops for the next 200 years, but are not actually about symbolism. They're about uh, representation and perception. Uh, then when you get into the 20th century, uh, you get to the way in which the modernist art movements are again more about representation than symbolism. You might recognize that this is um, Picasso's dealer, Ambroise Vollard, painted in 1910 in what we call analytical cubist kind of style. And of course, famously, that was the beginning of the notion of modern art being a form of abstraction and the way in which they wanted to get away from what had been the convention since the Renaissance of single viewpoint perspective, where everything fitted together, as in the um, Alberti and um, Brunelleschi system. Whereas here, what Picasso is doing is to say that actually our conceptual knowledge is derived in time and space. And therefore, we don't only know a person from the front, but also from the side and also from above. And therefore, what you should do if you're doing a true analysis is actually to form the concept of what they're like, where you synthesize and put together the frontal view, the side view, the view from above, and then you also look for the kind of geometry, the kind of uh, geometrical analytical uh, uh, planes that actually make up the surfaces of the person that you're painting. But these pictures are of people, like Vala, or their objects and guitars and so on, and they don't carry any kind of symbolic value, and they're not about um, feeling. Uh, Reynal called uh, cubism conceptual art, because what it's doing is to deliberately get across the idea of what you see, and therefore it's not about their, uh, their heaven's uh, mixture of uh, perception and inner feeling. And then when you get to the um, way in which installation art is going to um, work, you get to an image like uh, the store by uh, Klaus Oldenburg. Sorry, you, you get to the movement that is actually most associated with symbolism in art in the 20th century. Obviously, this is Salvador Dali, Persistence of Memory, 1931, and it's uh, what would be called surreal. But the paradox is that, in fact, this is a painting and a style that actually ignores the developments of modern abstract art. Surrealism deliberately set out to be a realistic kind of way of painting, as in Dali and as in uh, Magritte. And therefore, this is, in my opinion, not truly a merging of perception and inner feeling. Because, of course, as you know, uh, the uh, Surrealist Revolution was deliberately based around reading Freud and his theory of symbols, where you have all sorts of desires and fears in your id, and then your conscious self is going to repress them and turn what are the desires that you have into symbolic forms. And the figure that is uh, lying on the ground on the right is the image that Dali liked to use of himself. And then this painting famously has, or as you can see, these melting camemberts, these melting clocks. And it's therefore an image about hard and soft. And Dali was preoccupied until he met Gaia with the problems of his own uh, impotence and homosexuality. And therefore, this is his self-image of his own softness, his own impotence, partly in the cut-off tree and then in the melting of the clocks. And then you have on the left this fleshy fruit, which is uh, his view of women, where, as you can see, it is literally crawling with ants because he had this very strong Spanish Catholic guilt feeling about um, his sexuality. And I would argue that this is therefore not really the kind of symbolism that we're going to be talking about today, because you use a realistic style to actually show things. And the things that you show are not expressive of how you perceive things and show, their, show your own inner feelings. Instead, I think that uh, surrealism is not about the unconscious. I think it's the most self-conscious and conscious form of art in the 20th century, where you simply read a Freudian textbook and then you deliberately use a realistic style to actually paint these objects, which then you claim 
are going to be symbols from the unconscious, but really they're simply the intellectual abstractions, conceptual kind of art that you get from reading an overdose of Freud. And that also, in my opinion, is what is happening when you get to installation art in the later 20th century. So this is Klaus Oldenburg, 1961, the store. And what you've got here is an image looking through the window of a shop. And you have all these objects which are sometimes real, sometimes overpainted, sometimes in really bad state of rubbish and decay. And again, the installation is actually about concepts and ideas where he is expressing his own image and disgust at the kind of uh, wealth of the bourgeois capitalist consumer society in America in the 1960s. And this kind of conceptual installation art has then gone on to dominate much of what is created in the late 20th century. So this is 1961. And is Tracy Emin in 1998 actually doing anything different whatsoever compared to Klaus Oldenburg in the 60s, where you simply take objects, you put them on display in the gallery, and then you add a few ideas, a few concepts, and claim that this is symbolizing uh, your life or society today. And therefore, in my opinion, lots of the art movements that have existed since 1800 have been antithetical to symbolism. Whereas what we're going to do is to pick out some of the things where symbolism does actually become important to people in the period after 1800. So if you consider uh, the impact of romanticism and the way in which romanticism was wanting to actually create art forms that were going to express yourself, your feelings, your inner feelings, your emotions, then you begin to get a new kind of symbolism appearing, which no longer simply bases itself around classical mythology, as we saw in the Middle Ages or in the Renaissance. And if you go to the kind of works that were produced by William Blake in the late 18th century, you get this kind of symbolism, which is really very personal to William Blake, where he creates his own symbols of his feelings. And this is the Ancient of Days from about 1794. And it's very similar, isn't it, to the uh, Newton as creator. And it expresses his own antipathy to 18th century um, nationalism, to the world of Newton, to the world of everything being designed by a superior power, a god figure, and then everything fitting in its place, geometrically proportioned and placed. Whereas he, in his imagination, lived in a riotous world where he was constantly having all these kind of visions, visions of angels, visions of devils and fleas, and then produced these kind of strange fantasy images like this image of the sun and the serpent, which he created out of his own imagination from re looking at the works of people like Michelangelo and Fuseli, and then linked to religious mysticism like in Swedenborg, but then created this entirely personal kind of mythology, which didn't exist anywhere before, but is his own creation where you can perceive through the way that he has got these fantastic skills of actually creating these kind of ideals and monsters. And then you can see how they symbolize the forces that he felt were inside the universe and inside himself. And another area of mythology that becomes interesting to symbolists is going to in fact be turning away from the Western tradition to interest in the Orient. So we've often looked at the way in which things like philosophy led to the um, interest in Oriental philosophy and to modern art. And when you consider somebody like Gauguin, you look at the last paintings that he produced. This is um, a painting which is given the title of Where Do We Come From, Where Are We Going, and so on. And this is one of the last paintings that he produced. And this is entirely in the symbolist tradition of Paris in the 1890s, because he deliberately left a bourgeois stockbroker's life, left his marriage, and he turned, didn't he, to the Pacific, to Tahiti, to the Marquesas, and then produced these kind of paintings, which were his way of symbolizing his own desires for a different kind of world, a world that he viewed as more primitive, more linked to emotion, more linked to your own animal life. 
And in the Day of the Gods in 1894, you have the glory of the color and the pattern that he found in places like Tahiti and that influenced his art. And then you have also this strange godlike creature in the center, which is basically his own creation. Uh, it isn't really based on actual contemporary Tahitian religion, because as you can see, they're mostly clothed and they're being influenced by the Christian missionaries that he hated. Whereas he viewed Tahiti as he hoped an ideal lost paradise of nature, and then provided him with these young girls as his brides who paints three times in the middle and center of the picture. And therefore creates his own symbolic mythology, his own symbolic world out of what he had uh, seen. But there was in the late 19th century, literally a new symbolist movement. And you could argue that it began in literature in France in the 1880s. So if you wanted a quick introduction, go to Arthur Simmons' book, which is on the uh, symbolist movement in literature. And we'll see later how it had a big influence on what was going on. Another aspect of Romanticism that was going to uh, develop a new kind of uh, symbolic way of painting is going to be in the landscapes of Caspar David Friedrich. And I would argue that they're, again, the very opposite of the sort of thing that people like Constable were trying to paint. This is an 1808 painting that was done as an altarpiece, and uh, you nowadays mostly see it literally just as the painting. And what he's done is to take an event, the crucifixion from Christian mythology, and he's then set it not on Gol -Gol Golgotha, but instead on this uh, mountain with these trees like daggers pointing into the sky. And therefore what he's done is to take uh, the landscape and use the landscape itself as a symbol of um, what he was uh, trying to feel. And he talked about how you shouldn't only paint the world outside yourself, what you should do is to paint the world within, within yourself. And he talked about how in this painting, you have the image of uh, Christ dying on this bleak mountain with these dagger-like trees. And then the light in the background is meant to be the light of God himself. And you can see the same in this painting of the Abbey, where you have the Abbey ruined as a result of Thirty Years' War. You then have in the foreground a group of monks carrying a body to be buried in the Abbey. And then the strangest thing in the whole painting is obviously going to be these kind of um, trees, uh, these images where he has deliberately taken the trees bared in winter, turned them into these grotesque and uh, sharp uh, shapes, which are so threatening and so dangerous and represent his horror of death. Whereas in the background, you then have the kind of light that is meant to be, again, his hope in Christian religion, where beyond death and the darkness in the foreground, you can get to the light of God that he believed spiritually he could feel. And just after he married, he did this painting of himself and his new bride in Rügen, which is an area of the Baltic coast in Germany, where you can see him and his wife in the corners of the picture. And then in their new marriage, you have this ecstatic landscape opening up with the white of the cliffs and the blue of the sea, where you have this glorious celebration of their love. But as he got old, he suffered from strokes and became ill. And he did fairly bleak later paintings like this ice sea, where you can have a painting which is highly realistic. It is based on perception. It's skillfully showing the formations of the ice cracking and so on, and the ship being crushed. But it's really actually about inner feeling. And it's about despair and lack of hope and the way in which the world and nature can turn against you as you're getting old and you're about to die, and therefore literally ends up with this kind of crushing effect upon you. So you've got the way in which the 19th century was going to use and develop uh, this kind of landscape where it was going to actually express your own inner feelings. And in the late 19th century, 
there was actually a symbolist movement that developed in, uh, first of all, in France in the 1880s. And this is Arthur Simmons' book, Symbolist Movement in Literature, which is still good to read in terms of what the symbolist movement is actually about. The French poets like uh, Baudelaire wrote symbolic poems. Uh, this is Mallarmé, as in uh, Gauguin's portrait. And therefore you had a whole group of writers in the 1880s in France who were deliberately creating a kind of symbolist poetry where what they wanted to do was to get away from the lush romanticism of Keatsian and Tennysonian kind of uh, rhetoric. And instead, they wanted to create a poetry that was going to actually represent their own inner kind of ideals. And in particular, was going to associate and link to the depiction of mood so that they do poems which describe events and places where they evoke as strongly as they can the kind of mood that they were actually feeling. So therefore you've got literary movement of symbolism and then you get the same thing happening in art as well. So if you went to Belgium, you could go to exhibitions by Les Vins, the 20th, and they were a group of artists who got together in the late 1880s to put on special shows in Brussels and Paris where they could have the chance to show their new kind of symbolist um, art. And in Paris, some of the most interesting of the shows developing in showing symbolist art were going to be organized by Sarpeladon. This is um, a portrait of him by Felix Seon, and it shows him as Merodach, as the Babylonian priest, because he was somebody who was interested in the occult. He wrote novels that were symbolist and decadent, and he deliberately set out to organize these exhibitions, Les Salons de Rose Croix, where the Salon de Rose Croix was taking its name from the occult movement in the 17th century called Rosicrucianism, which had claimed to actually be able to offer a synthesis of the old hermetic magic of the Renaissance and put together a new kind of ideal world beyond the uh, natural world that we actually every day lived in. And therefore you have a poster like this where you have the figures moving towards the way from the normal bourgeois world and rising up to uh, the light that you can see in the center of the painting. And they attracted painters from Belgium, from France, who could come and freely exhibit the Salon de Rosecroix, their new kind of style. Therefore, you get the development of a new kind of symbolist painting. And you can see how it's different from what else was going on if you consider portraiture. This is a painting by Fernand Knopf, who exhibited at the Salon de Rosecroix. And this is a painting of his sister Marguerite in 1887. And I would argue that it's again the very antithesis of what we saw in Sargent when he was painting This is Chester Beatty, because you've gone away from the kind of showiness of the brushwork, the showiness of the dress, and instead you have this uh, simplicity where he paints his own sister Marguerite and he deliberately paints her in these pale colours. He obviously is knowing about uh, artists like Whistler and Poirier in Denmark, and therefore was trying to do a very intimate painting of what he felt about his own sister. Therefore, he produced um, these pictures going to be intimate and full of feeling and were not so much portraits of social status, but instead were going to actually be about the way um, you were going to show uh, something about the feelings of the people on them. And he produced a whole series of strange symbolist paintings. This kind of rectangular format, this kind of heavy gold frame was popular. And this is a painting entitled, I Lock Myself, I Lock My Door Upon Myself. And this is based on a poem by Christina Rossetti, the Green Raphaelite uh, poet, where she wrote a poem about retreating from the world in the face of death and then painting literally, as you can see, herself. And you have this picture, which is a kind of portrait, but it's a symbolic portrait because of uh, the way that it has been framed in terms of the geometrical shapes and the abstraction. And then you've got the contrast between the flower beside her, I think it's an orange um, iris, and then above the iris, do you see how there's actually a mask 
and the mask is of Hypnos, the god of dreams and sleep. And then you have this woman who is deliberately posed in this awkward way so that she is actually behind these objects. She's retreated away from us. And uh, Knopf himself wrote about how he wanted to live in this house away from the modern material world. And therefore he does a portrait where the woman is not made to be part of social status, but instead is shown having all these inner feelings of dread and retreat from the world. And then he can do drawings like this, where he turns the woman actually into a kind of mask, where you have this face that floats, emerges, almost uh, as a floating head coming out of nowhere in a kind of hypnotic kind of uh, vision. And it also links into the way in which um, the symbolism of his ideas shows in the faces of the characters, as in this double picture of the Sphinx, where you have the man on the left, you then have the woman on the right as the uh, leopard. And it links into the way in which these faces are going to be kind of mask-like faces, which symbolize the relationship between the man and the woman. And therefore you end up with portraits that are not about social status, not showy flashy painting, but instead are based on perception so that it's highly realistic. But at the same time, it's really about inner feelings that uh, Knopf had about the relationship between men and women. And then we've seen before this strange portrait by Jean Delville, another Belgian symbolist of Mrs. Stuart Merrill, the wife of the American poet, where she is again like a kind of mask floating out of kind of nowhere, staring at us as if she is actually hypnotizing and therefore being portrayed virtually as a medium, where it's the inner feeling that matters, not actually what her particular body shape, face or clothes actually represent. Therefore, you get a new genre of really symbolist kind of portraits coming into um, existence. You also get the development of um, symbolist um, landscape. So again, we're looking at the work of Fernand Knopf. And when you look at a painting like this, this is the very opposite of an impressionist painting. It does show realistically what you perceive. You can see the trees reflected in the water, but the point of the painting is not to simply record perception. Uh, I would argue that the point of a painting like this is to actually establish mood. And it's actually called Silent Waters. And what it does is to show the stillness of the water. And then it locks everything together in this frame, where again, you've got the rectangular format. And then you have these trees, which are a kind of rhythm that divide up the painting geometrically so that what you get is a kind of abstracted landscape, a landscape which suggests a certain mood of stillness, of fixity, and therefore is not about the impression of what you see, but is about actually what you feel in a landscape like this. And if he paints a wood, then it turns out to be highly formulaic um, like this. Uh, not that many woods actually grow their trees with the pathway like this. This is much more like some kind of primitive temple, which might lead your eye to an altar in the distance. And therefore, he literally sets out to create an abstract geometry and create a mood of what I presume is meant to be kind of spiritual entering into the mystery of the wood. Whereas when you look at the um, sinister landscape, what you have here is another landscape of trees, but this time they're not regular and in a pattern that looks spiritual. Instead, as you can see, they twist and they have these dark colors and these rather sickly kind of greens. And therefore it was nicknamed the sinister wood, the sinister landscape. And it again is deliberately trying to show the mood of what he felt. Now these kind of um, <clears throat> symbolic landscapes existed all over uh, Europe. And in particular, there was a strong Scandinavian mood of symbolism 
which was shown in the works of uh, Akseli Kalela Galen. And when you look at this, you might think that this is actually pretty much an impressionistic kind of image of Finland with the setting sun on the water, reflections of light, the sky, the mountains, and so on. And therefore, some of Galen Kalela's paintings, because he'd been to Paris, were very much what you might call impressionistic. But a lot of them go beyond that and are actually much more about creating a mood. So when you look at this lake, which is frozen, you have again this way of painting where you deliberately create a kind of grid where you have the trees and their reflections. And then you have the uh, verticals and horizontals of the icy water. And again, although this is about light reflecting on water, I think you get a very strong sense of not only the literal physical coldness of Finnian and Finnish lakes, but also a kind of emotional calm because of the way that he has painted the water and its um, reflections. And then when you look at the um, way in which he painted uh, snow, you've got the contrast between the plain blank whiteness of the coating of snow. You've got the vivacity of the tree on the right, which is still green and growing. But then you've got what are presumably the shadows of trees coming across the bottom left of the painting. And it's difficult to make out what exactly they are. They don't really look like the actual trees themselves. They look much more like abstract uh, kind of dagger-like shapes that are encroaching on the landscape and therefore are deliberately trying to create a sense of mood rather than literally the reflections of things off of light off trees and on snow. And that meant that he then could produce an image of snow which was going to be in close-up like this where undoubtedly on rocks and on trees you did get these enormous bluffs of white snow that actually formed but when you start looking at it don't you actually see instead this kind of um, pay, this kind of uh, formation of strange abstract shapes which coalesce together and which are therefore actually far more about suggesting emotional coldness rather than literally the forms in which snow falls and lands on objects. Therefore, lots of Scandinavian landscape is highly realistic. It's based on perception of what you do actually see, but it deliberately symbolizes more than light and the feelings that living in the cold Scandinavian landscape actually creates. And you get also a development in symbolist um, photography. Uh, these are works by the Englishman P.H. Emerson, who produced a book on the North Broads in 1886. And here, what you've got is the edge of the Broads. This is presumably somewhere like Ipswich, where you've actually got on the left the cranes of the port. You've then got the smoke that comes from the industry of the town. But the majority of the images in his book are actually going to be of the Broads themselves. And when you look at that, you're looking at an image which he wanted to record the natural light that came across the broads as the sun was setting. And therefore, you could argue that this is a kind of natural impressionistic kind of painting. But what I actually enjoy in P.H. Emerson's photographs is the way that actually when he takes photos of scenes in, for example, winter, you get this sort of imagery where you have the little tiny houses on the far left, which are dominated by the cold. And then you have the whiteness of the expanse of the snow. And then you have the broken down fence. You have a tree that looks like the trees that we were seeing in Caspar David Friedrich, where the bleakness of the broads and their cold in winter is established. So you get a very strong sense of mood from a picture like this. And again, when you look at his picture of trees in the snow, this is again the same rectangular format that we've been seeing in other paintings. And again, you've got this kind of grid-like uh, foreground with its horizontal. And then you've got the pattern of the straight branches, straight trunks of the trees going up, which means that he creates this very still, very cold, very abstract kind of landscape. And then when you look at the um, reeds in the foreground here, you have a real photo of the bronze, but then you have this distribution 
of these lines as if drawn across the water in the foreground, where the reed bed actually again establishes the sort of mood of what the painting, uh, what the photo is about. And therefore, although photography is inherently apparently about realism and capturing light, in the 1890s, for a whole series of highly skillful photographers, people like Clarence White and then eventually Edward Weston, who were going to actually create uh, photos which were going to be much more symbolic rather than the realism of the medium itself. And you also get a lot of um, symbolist paintings which were about um, places and cityscapes. Uh, this is um, Lucien Levy Derma. He was working in France in the 1890s and he visited Venice in 1895. And when you first look at this, you might think that what he's actually doing is uh, virtually a ripoff, a copy of a Monet, because it's virtually the same, isn't it, as in Russian Sunrise. But if you look again at this painting, I would argue that that is not what it is actually about. You have the same kind of format of rectangle, the same grid of verticals and horizontals, and then you have his use of pastel, which creates this very pale kind of colour, which suggests certain things about the Venetian lagoon. It's not the Lido in high summer. It's not the sort of things that John C. Sargent painted. It is instead uh, a kind of melancholy about the actual lagoon. And you have here an image of distant Venice, and then the blue water, and the mist on the water. And then you have these strange anthropomorphized kind of gondolas that are floating in the foreground, so that you actually get a very strong sense of the mood of Venice. And if you go in the city itself, you then get to these kind of scenes where you deliberately choose to look through a bridge at this strange kind of angle, as if in a Japanese print, and you get this use of the same kind of uh, pale pastel blue color. And isn't this exactly the image of Thomas Mann of death in Venice? And therefore, when Lady Durma paints Venice, he isn't following Turner and looking at glorious light reflections. He is instead choosing a moon which suggests that Venice is, in some senses, somehow a kind of sinister city, a city of something to be afraid of, something to be frightened of, as in death in Venice. Um, Fernand Knopf himself came from Bruges, and therefore a lot of his paintings are going to be of what you can still see if you go and visit Bruges. And when you look at a picture like this, you might think that we're looking at mere topography, where uh, he's very skillful at doing the perspective. He can show you the beautiful old medieval buildings that are everywhere still to be seen in the city of um, Bruges. But that isn't actually necessarily the intention of what he is painting. Because when you look at this, it's given a particular title. It's given the title Memories of Bruges, because Bruges was the city in which he had actually grown up. And therefore, again, it's not a record of the actual architecture. It is instead a suggestion of the kind of mood that he felt when he was um, in the city. It's got the same kind of rectangular shape, the same verticals and horizontals, the same big gold frame that makes you concentrate on the image. And then it's got this very pale gray, no hint of color, no hint of exuberance. And instead, this image of the memory of, of Bruges as a rather old and decaying kind of uh, town. Because famously, as you know, Bruges had been incredibly wealthy in the Middle Ages, it had been a very busy, vital port. But then the rivers that came from the uh, sea got silted up and therefore it got caught in a kind of time frame of history and is therefore a place simply of memories. And you can see this most clearly in the little novel that was written by Georges Rodenbach. This is um, Lady Durmer's portrait of Georges Rodenbach, who is a Belgian surrealist, as Belgian symbolist um, writer. And you can see behind him the city of Venice. And in 1892, he produced a short novel, 
about a widower who goes to visit uh, Bruges. And what he does is to uh, describe the feelings that he has when he goes around the city. And the painting is by, the next painting is by Henri de Sidanie, and this is called Bruges la Mort. And Bruges la Mort is the title of George Rodenbach's book. And the book was about the widower going round and feeling sadder and sadder when he moved through the city of Bruges. Because you have these beautiful old buildings that have been preserved, but you're in a dead city, a city of the dead, because it had lost its economic function. It was still very quiet. It wasn't quite the tourist center that it is today. And therefore you get a painting like this, where you get him deliberately trying to paint in the year the novel came out, uh, the mood of novel, the mood of being in the dead city, Bruges, where you have this composition of verticals and horizontals. You have mostly darkness in the reflections. You have the subtle colors of the um, painted plasterwork. You have a few lights in windows, but overall, this is meant to evoke the mood of Bruges as a city of the dead. And another artist who worked in cities is in Denmark, Wilhelm Hammershoi. And Hammershoi famously painted a lot of paintings literally here in the courtyard and interior of his own house in uh, Copenhagen. And what you've got is here his studio. You have this kind of completely empty room with simply the easel there. And you have this composition made up of all these um, abstract geometrical shapes that are placed in opposition to each other. And he visited um, uh, Holland in the early part of his career in the 1890s. And when he was there, he much admired the work of Vermeer. And therefore, when you look at a painting like this, this servant woman kind of reading, it is virtually a Vermeer painting because you have this virtually the same as several paintings that Vermeer did with the meticulous skill of representing what you can perceive of literally the uh, perspective of the building, of the folds of the cloth on the table, of the woman's still pose and so on. But you can see how Hamashoi is different because the luxurious colors, the brightness of the yellows and the blues and the reds that appear in so many Vermeer paintings have been abolished. Uh, this is virtually monochrome painting. It's all to do with gray, isn't it? And therefore you get a very strong sense of mood. And a lot of the paintings that he produced are simply going to be literally interiors. So we saw the outside courtyard. Here's the window and it lets light into the room, but the room itself is fairly dark. And then when you get to other interiors, they are highly realistic. They are indeed perception. They're based on exactly what you can see in the different rooms, all of rather sparse kind of furniture. But then what you have is the mystery. And the mystery is in relation to the way in which she is preoccupied with painting doors like this, where what he does is to deliberately show you openings that lead you into passageways, that take you to places, and then there's actually nothing there. There are no people. All you have is these empty spaces. All you have is these doors that open and offer you invitations, but to nothingness. And therefore you end up with this kind of mood of melancholy because of the grayness of the building, because of the sparseness and the abstraction of the relationship of all these geometrical shapes. And therefore you end up with a painting which is based on perception, but is all about inner feeling, which he represented through the way he painted his own house and his life in that house as a very solitary kind of individual painting these moody gray kind of pictures. So we've seen how in the 19th century, the symbolist movement develops all these different kinds of ways of painting and using things, landscapes and cities and interiors as symbols. But you also get the development of a new kind of symbolism, arguably, in the 20th century, 
in the developments of um, modern art. And therefore, if we go to Paris in 1903 and we look at uh, Picasso before he moves into Cubism, this is a painting called La Vie from 1903 in his so-called blue period. You can obviously see the way in which this is actually using a new kind of symbolism. He had a blue period, a pink period, where he constantly painted with a very deliberately limited kind of palette, where he's chosen colours because of what they might symbolise. And if you remember what La Vie is about, it means life. And you have on the right, the woman with the new baby. Then on the left, you have the woman clinging to and loving the man. And then famously, the face of the man changes. In original drawings, the face of the man is actually Picasso himself. Whereas in this, this is a portrait of his Spanish poet friend, Casagemas, who, as you probably know, committed suicide. And there's a lovely um, painting by Picasso of uh, the dead Casagemas shot in the head in the Musée Picasso in Paris. And what you have is a sad story where he and uh, Casagemas were poor in the march. They were both living fairly promiscuous lives. They both were looking for mistresses. He was a rival of Picasso's. And in some senses, Picasso may have felt guilt about actually taking away from uh, Casagemas, the woman that Casagemas loved. And Casagemas points to the matriarch, the mother with the baby and the fertility of life. On the wall behind, there is a loving couple. But do you see how he turns away from the woman who actually loved both him and also Picasso? And what Picasso does here is to paint an image of life where life turns into the tragedy of his friend Casagemas' suicide that he may have felt partially responsible for. And of course, that's why this is a blue painting. Uh, the blues were a kind of music that was just beginning to be known from America in the early 20th century in Paris. And the phrase to feel the blues, the coldness of this kind of color was around in literature at this time. And therefore you begin to get the way in which in modern art, the big new movement is going to be away from realism and towards abstraction. But abstraction itself can be symbolic. And in lots of ways, you get the use of abstract color in the early 20th century in Paris as symbol. Now that had been Picasso in 1903. This is Matisse in 1904. This is a year before the full Fauvist exhibitions. And this is his painting, Lux Calme et Volupte, which is based title from a poem by um, Baudelaire. And it is about, as you can see, Lux in the sense of luxury, lechery, lust, where you have all these nude women. Calm, because you've got the heat of the day and you have the women resting and picnicking together. And then volupte, which is the term for voluptuousness and the curvaceous bodies of the women. And this is just the beginning of his new theory of actually how to choose color. If you remember what the Impressionists said, they said that what you should do is to paint what you can see. And all you can see is light. And light is simply the prism of color. And therefore, Impressionist color is claimed to be what you can see. Whereas Matisse famously talked about how he chose his colors, not by what he could see, but by what he felt. And therefore, Lux Calme et Volupte has all these incredible reds so that the sand on which the figures are lying is painted in this very bold red. You have the bright yellow of the sun on the water. You have the coolness of the water itself. And therefore, these colors are all about deliberately actually using color as a symbol of your own kind of inner feelings. And these Fauvist ideas quickly spread and uh, were influential all over Europe where you no longer had to paint the colors that are actually there, the colors that you actually see. And therefore, when uh, Mondrian did his tree series, he produced at one point this, which is a kind of expressionist version of a tree, where no tree is ever actually pillarboxed red like that. 
but is incredibly freely painted. It has uh, the use of uh, the branches so that they're broken, they're dagger-like, as we saw in Friedrich and as we saw in Kalela Galen. And therefore, this tree is an example of a kind of furious painting where the colour itself is the intensity of the feeling that he has when he was actually painting this particular version of his tree. And when you go to Germany in about 1909, and you look at the Blue Rider group and Franz Marc, you have the famous joke that he made when this painting, the Blue Horse, was criticized, where he had this painting on exhibition and uh, the people in the gallery came to him and complained. Where did you? I can't hear anything. That came to him and complained that horses are not blue. And therefore, what his reply was, that this is not a horse. This is a painting of a horse. And therefore, the Blue Rider and the Phobes had the freedom to actually deliberately choose colour as a medium of expression. And when he paints a thick picture like these red foxes, he kept notebooks. And in his notebooks, he described what the different colours actually meant. And red to him was the colour of blood. Red to him was the colour of violence was the colour of animality. And therefore he has this kind of cubist style of foxes and then he paints them with this very intense kind of red because it is actually the colour itself that is symbolising his inner feelings. And another member of the Blue Rider group was going to be Vasily Kandinsky. And at this point in 1911, he was producing a new series of really completely abstract pictures called Improvisations and this is composition number four in 1911, and again, he wrote about what actually he hoped was going on. He talked about the reds and the yellows being the symbols of uh, human uh, emotions. Uh, you may remember that he was influenced by the ideas of Charles Letterbetter and his book Thought Forms, where actually inside yourself, you created a kind of astral being where the colors and shapes were actually expressions of the inner emotions that you had. And when you have the reds and the yellows, these are the colors of conflict inside yourself. Whereas the intense blue that you can see here is his image of the heavenly colors. And this is the moment, 1909, when he produced his book on the spiritual in art. And therefore you have all these painters in the early 20th century, the beginning of modernism, actually using abstract color itself as a form of symbol. Uh, you get not only the use of colour, but also the use of shape as a way of actually expressing inner feeling. So this is Maurice Vlamink. It's called Party in the Country. And it's simply the boy taking his girlfriend out for a picnic in the countryside. And you can see how he's influenced by Fauvism with the red tree. You can see the brushwork is very reminiscent of his favourite Macaw. But what he's done is to take the couple and the boy with his arm around the girl's shoulder. And then he's created this circle, hasn't he? By his brushwork, by the shapes, where the party in the country, the lovemaking, is actually shown by the very abstract shapes that are put together with the colors in this um, painting. And by the 1920s, you're beginning to get artists producing ideas where shape on its own can actually be a symbol. And in the 1920s, uh, Kandinsky got the job, as you know, of teaching at the Bauhaus of Gropius. And he produced this in it, this book called Point, Line and Plane, which was all about the way in which actually you could create a new kind of a, emotional imagery simply out of shapes and uh, colors. And when you go inside, he illustrated it with images like this. And what you have here, is abstract patterns of lines, but it is actually entitled Diagonal Tension. And you've got the contrast, haven't you, between the uh, circular, the curved lines, which are going to be, he thought, more feminine, and the straight lines, which are instead going to be more masculine. And therefore you get this new kind of imagery where the um, shapes themselves are going to actually um, create this new kind of um, imagery. Uh, by the 1940s, you get to the development of another form of abstraction, and this is going to be abstract 
action painting. And you obviously have Pollock here at work, actually creating his paintings by movement. And they are actually records of the actions he took when he was dripping paint and using his brush and so on. And when you look at a large painting like Rhythm, which is in the Met in uh, New York, you have here an image of what appears often to be to be a fast improvised work in the surrealist tradition of a uh, kind of random, almost uh, abstract and uh, uh, accidental shapes. Whereas he himself talked about how he worked slowly, consciously, deliberately. And the painting is entitled Rhythm because he has the multiplicity of all these abstract and uh, random kind of forms. But what he then does is to put them together into a rhythm, a pattern. And therefore the very actions of painting itself becomes symbolic. Therefore, what I've tried to do today is to show how there is this new kind of symbolism in Romanticism and Modernism. We saw in the Middle Ages how symbols were often to do with concealment, repression, how they were often taking the Christian ideas and they were imposing them on classical mythology and on subjects and scenes, and therefore creating a kind of allegorical repressive kind of symbolism. Whereas in the Renaissance, they had this new valuation of the hermetic wisdom that appeared in symbols whose immediacy, like in John Dee's uh, the hieroglyphics, were going to actually bring together and create a new kind of revelation. And I claim that actually you have this new ideal in the Renaissance of emblems being able to actually use symbols in poetry and in pictures to put together your own personal uh, ideas. And then we looked at Michelangelo and the way in which he expressed his own personal emotions and feelings and ideas in, first of all, his works for Cavalieri, and then in his late religious paintings. Whereas I would claim that after 1800, symbols become one of the key revelations of emotion. I think that what we've seen today is the way in which romantic landscape and romantic portraiture and so on, we're going to actually be able to express inner feeling. They're based on perception. They're based on apparently realism. But what the artist does is to create from the perceptions that he sees a symbolic world that expresses the moods and emotions that he felt. And that even when you move away from representation and perception, and when you get to abstraction, you again have the use of color and shape as actually symbols of your own inner emotions. And it's this kind of epiphany, this kind of power of symbols to not just conceal, but also to reveal and to synthesize. That is why I've always been so fascinated by symbolism. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. So if you have any questions or comments for Robert, would you like to put them in the chat? Um, one question that had, ah, yes, from, um, from Robert. Robert, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure, Robert. It's very simple. Did the symbolist photographers have a background as painters initially? Um, very often they'd been to art schools, uh, yes, and therefore they knew about the notions of uh, composition in landscape painting and so on. And they also were interested in the whole of the art world that was around. And there's a big symbolist movement in uh, photography in the 1890s. Mm. And it's very interesting as well, the way they fra frame the subjects of the buildings, the very mm. tightness of that. Yep. Um, I think that we had a theme today, didn't we, of mm. how geometrical a lot of the paintings and photos were of both, the, obviously, the buildings, but also the landscapes themselves. And therefore, they are symbolists themselves beginning to move towards using abstraction as a form of symbolism. Thank you. And, and do you think that the spiritualism movement of the sort of 19th century had an effect on some of these? Some of these uh, yes, uh, we could have done a lot more on how actually symbolism was linked into the occult and how it was actually about often trying to show the spiritual rather than physical material world. But I almost deliberately left that out or didn't do much on it because it's the sort of thing that we covered in quite a lot of detail when we did that series on art and the occult. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. And that takes, as you say, takes you off in a whole different direction. Mm. But it definitely would have been relevant. Yeah. 
So if nobody else has any questions, um, I will just say thank you, Robert, for an absolutely fascinating lecture. And of course, thank you to our audience um, for making this lunchtime so enjoyable. And if you'd like to catch up on any of Robert's previous talks, do copy out the link in the chat facility, which will take you to our online video library to view at your leisure. Next week, we have two evening talks to look forward to. And next Thursday from 7 to 8 p.m., former head Peter Winter will give a tutorial on French literature and he'll be discussing Racine's tragedy Britannicus. Then to conclude the week on Friday at an earlier time of 6 to 7 p.m., we have a very special evening with Andrew Knight, Chairman of Times Newspapers Limited, and Zanny Minton Beddoes, Editor-in-Chief of The Economist. And they'll debate a range of topics related to the future of the media. And they'll welcome any questions about what's going on in the world. So should you wish to join either of these events, please do just copy out and click on the forthcoming events link in the chat before you leave. That brings us to the end of today's event. Thank you again to Robert. Thank you again from all of us at Latimer and we hope to see you soon and have a lovely afternoon.